Hey everyone, I'm Alfred. Welcome back to Morrowind. As we mentioned last time, we're finally seeing the Palace of Vivek. <sighs> We've heard about him so much. And this is the first time we actually get to meet him. Let's just see, you know? I mentioned that the final bosses are some of the only people that could give them pause. Vivek might be one of those. <laughs> Fuck. God, I'm actually having to, like, dance around him here. I did it! Alright, so, you can break in here and find this thing, the unique Dwemer artifact, at any point in the game. It's a glove, as you can tell. Um, if you take this to Yagram Begarn, he will say, Oh, this is Wraithguard, the thing that you need in order to use the other tools of Kaganrak. Thank goodness you have it. And he, he whips you up a bullshit version. But Vivek is just going to give this to us. But yeah, this is the man god. Here he is. You can see that he's wearing a little bit of armor. Um, but because the rest of him is naked, it's very obvious that he's doing this for the clout. Half of him is the gold skin of the Chimer. Half is the gray skin of the Dunmer. And yeah, that appears to be chitin and then bone mold that he's wearing. Then he's got this bracelet and this armband and this loincloth. And that's kind of it. For the past 20 years, the tribunal have tried unsuccessfully to execute this plan. The plan to defeat Dagothor. Because we failed, we were required to stage an assault and simultaneously maintain the ghost fence to prevent the large-scale breakout of Dagoth Ur's blighted hosts. With Noreverine leading the assault and the tribunal free to devote their full energies to maintaining the ghost fence, the plan has a greater chance of success. Unfortunately, however, the loss of the artifacts Sunder and Keening and the increase in Dagoth Earth's strength poses new problems with the execution. Therefore, we have five phases. Raid the in scout <coughs> Aggressive raids to scout inside the ghost fence. Aggressive raids to neutralize Dagoth Earth's ash vampire kin and recover artifacts from the bodies of his kin. An assault on Gate Citadel... Vemnal to neutralize Dagoth Vemin and recover the ancient hammer sunder. An assault on the Gate Citadel Ordosal to neutralize Dagoth Orgos Ordos and recover the artifact blade Keating. So yes, those are two of the three tools of Kaganrak. And one of them, as we've seen, is in D is in Vivek's pocket. Where exactly he's keeping it, I don't really want to know, but considering that he has prodigious use of holes um I think he at one point gave birth to like a mountain with his ass um and that may or may not be an exaggeration please go read the 36 lessons of Vivek or wait for my videos on them anyway um doo -doo -doo. and then an assault on Citadel Dagoth with the artifacts Wraithguard Keening and Sunder to sever Dagoth Ur's connection to the heart of Lorcan and destroy him. Raids inside of the ghost fence. The tribunal ordinators and buoyant armagers are familiar with the terrain and will provide maps and current intelligence reports. The region inside the ghost fence is very dangerous and the Noreverine will need to be familiar with its particular challenges. After measuring skills and resources against Dagoth Ur's defenses, the Noreverine will know better how to play pace a campaign, alternating raids with improving skills, getting better equipment and stockpiling resources. 
So at some point in the game, I believe this was actually an intended um, method of play, but it is so like, I, I can see why they cut it out. First and foremost, it's really fucking hard to code something like this. Even if you're just doing your like Facebook missions, like in the middle era Assassin's Creed games, or um, in like Dragon Age or uh, Inquisition, I can see why they wouldn't go with this. Because the thing about those games is that you are one person in a very large story. Yes, you're the Inquisitor in the game Inquisition, but the game is just about the Inquisition and you are the leader of it. The game is about all of the soldiers who fight in it, all of the people on the supply lines, and yes, you get more done than anyone else in the entire game, but it's not just about you. Um, in Assassin's Creed, the game is about the creed of the assassins, their whole line, all of that. So getting people to help you out, getting party members and followers, and what's more, sending out small armies of assassins to go get things done makes sense. But in this, it is about the hero. It is about the Nereverine. And truthfully, it is about Morrowind, but to put more fine of a point on it, Bethesda games are relentlessly single player. Like, even though you can have followers in like Skyrim and stuff, they are really just sidekicks. This game, these games, are about their protagonist and that's kind of it. So that would be why they wouldn't try harder to get this done. Although, one thing about the Elder Scrolls is that by its nature, it is a... It, it is a thing where like, the Elder Scrolls is a video game and every single video game of this type and everything in the Elder Scrolls have to be in interrelated. So like almost every Elder Scrolls game has to be like this. And Elder Scrolls games where you don't play in single player, where you don't have a create a character, um, and that are not RPGs are less popular. There are two books about the Elder Scrolls and nobody likes them. I mean, I've never heard anyone say that they like them, but it's possible that some people do. But it could be interesting to see the Elder Scrolls as something that's not a video game or a different genre of video game. There was this thing I was thinking about earlier where um, like almost all of the D&D &D games are RPGs that try to simulate D&D. &D. But there are cool things in D&D &D that don't need to be RPGs. And you know what? It would be cool, I think, if instead you had like character action games or strategy games or you know stuff set in the settings of D&D &D and that use those settings but don't feel the need to be like CRPGs that just simulate a tabletop RPG anyway Raids upon Vampire Citadels Dagother's kin have become markedly more powerful in recent decades after remaining stable for thousands of years if they can be individually isolated and destroyed they will not be able to support Dagother in the later stages of the war it may also be that the dramatic increase in their power comes from items enchanted by Dagoth Ore. Salvage of such items might contribute to our resources. Essential to recover the uh, artifact Haver Sumber, Sunder for Part 5. Dagoth Vemin has possession of Sunder and probably seeks to discover the secret of his enchantments. We may also have access to notebooks and journals of Kaganrak that survived in the Dwemer workshops of Veminal. Um... This is pretty much the same thing, but for the knife. All the previous stages are preparations for this stage. Recent expedition shows Citadel Dagoth has under undergone extensive expansion. The location will need to be dis explored carefully. The known route to take to the Heart Chamber will be well defended. Alternative routes may exist. Dagoth will have anticipated our plans to destroy him by attacking the Heart, and we will he will almost certainly personally oppose approach to the Heart Chamber. Together, the Tribunal could not defeat him, and he has grown stronger than since then. Admittedly, the Tribunal has had the distraction of maintaining the Ghost's fence simultaneous with fighting Dagoth Ur, but even so, the challenge seems daunting. The adoption of this phased campaign seems to offer the best chances of success. In retrospect, the Tribunal's decision to directly assault Citadel Dagoth, rather than proceed step by step through lesser objectives, may have been seen to have been a serious error. The Tribunal did not feel it had the option of a slow-paced and deliberate campaign. 
given that they had many other competing priorities, not the least of which was the maintaining of the ghost fence and the outer defenses surrounding Red Mountain. The Nerevarine, on the other hand, should be best served with a careful step-by-step -step advance, along with the additional advantage of building confidence along the way, while securing well, successes would undermine Dagoth Ur's own assurance in his defenses. Employing the tools. The source of supernatural power is the heart of Lorca. The heart is the source of the tribunal's divine powers. In the mythic times, the gods took and hid Lorcan's heart beneath Red Mountain as a punishment for creating the mortal plane. The Redormer discovered the heart while creating underground colonies. High craft lord Kaganrak created enchanted tools intended to tap the power of the heart. The war of the first council was fought to prevent the sacrilege. Kaganrak's use of the tools and the disappearance of the Dwemer race marked the end of the war. Kaganrak's tools were recovered by Lord Nerevar and Dagoth Ur. Dagoth Ur was left to guard the tools while Nerevar came to consult with us, his advisors. In the absence, Dagoth Ur experimented with the tools upon the heart and was corrupted. We returned to discover a deranged Dagoth Ur who refused to turn over the tools. When he attacked us, he drove him away. We left Red Mountain with the tools, and so the Silla discovered their powers. Collectively, we used the tools to establish a connection with the heart, enabling ourselves to transform our mortal natures. Thus, we became the Tribunal. No mention of, Nere of where Nerevar went. Vivek doesn't like talking about the fact that he killed Lord Nerevar. And only does so secretly or in code, in fact. Dagoth had survived our attacks, and without the tools, in a manner not well understood, Dagoth had managed to establish a connection with the heart and transform himself into an immortal being. So he's a different type of god than the Tribunal. Completely different. Our plan to destroy Dagoth or also runs the risk of destroying the Tribunal. The plan is to permanently disrupt Kaganrak's enchantments upon the heart, severing connections with Dagoth and ourselves, and running us all again mortal. A mortal Kaganrak... A mortal Kaganrak may then be destroyed by mundane means. The loss of godhood and the possible death of the tribunal are judged a necessary risk and sacrifice. The normal procedure for establishing connection with the heart is a three-step process. The wearer of Wraithguard strikes the heart with a hammer sunder, causing the heat to produce a pure tone. This is again the Dwemer using sound as magic. Sound as a way of talking to the universe. The wearer of Wraithguard strikes the heart with a blade keening, shattering the pure tone into a prism tone shades. These shades are imprinted on the substance of the wear of Wraithguard, giving him an immortal and divine nature. The Nerevarine will not be taught the secret rituals to perform the third step. Instead, the Nerevarine will strike the heart with Keating for a second time, causing its tones to diverge into unstable patterns of interference. Further repeated strikes with Keating will further shatter the tones, with the ultimate result of shattering and dispelling Kaganrak's original enchantments binding the heart, thereby severing the heart's links with Dagoth Ur, destroying the heart whites and with the Tribunal. Um, destroying Kaganrak's enchantments on the heart will stop the corrupt effusion on the heart's divine power and end the blight on Morland. The Nerevarine may be tempted to steal the power of the heart. Dagothar and Sothasil alone know the secret. Ur may, in extremity, propose to teach Nerevarine to use Kaganrak's tools to become a god. We doubt the Nerevarine is fool enough to trust Dagothar and content to take this risk. Be warned, the Nerevarine cannot safely equip either Keening or Sunder unless wearing Wraithguard. The Nerevarine will be injured every moment while holding either of these artifacts unless protected by Wraithguard. Persistence will be rewarded with only death. If Nerevarine can equip an item while not wearing Wraithguard and receive no injury, the item is counterfeit. This was another thing cut. There was supposed to be a fake version of Sunder, the hammer. And you were supposed to be able to find it and pick it up after you've gotten Wraithguard. And so, if you were still wearing Wraithguard, you wouldn't notice it's not killing you. But taking it off would reveal that you have a fake Sunder. And there's a line wherein Dagoth Orr laughs and, like, calls you a ninny for picking up the fake Sunder. He says, <laughs> Did you get the false copy of Sunder? What a fool you are, Nerevar. How could you be so naive? Like, it's so derisive, and I don't know if it exactly fits with the rest of Ur's uh, characterization. But yes, um, that was cut, though. There is only one version of Sunder. There are two versions of Wraithguard, um, one of which is obtained if you kill Vivek and take the depowered glove to Yagram Bagarn. As the only surviving Dwemer, he can get the Dwemer machine to go work. And then the glove itself will try to kill you. 
But once you can resist the enchantments that the glove kills you with, then you can safely use the other things. One last note. Dagoth Ur must not get a hold of Wraith Guard. The Reverend must prepare a use of recall or Omsevi intervention if there is any risk of death or capture. So if you die, you reload the save, who cares? But they're telling you, like, hey, if you die, you must get the hell out of there. Um, that said, there is another line where Dagoth Ur says, no recall or intervention can work in this place. And he is correct. Um, Dagoth Ur will not expect you to destroy Kaganrak's enchantment on the heart. He does not know it's possible. He would not do it himself. And he knows we have never tried it. He will not believe anyone would want to sacrifice the promise of such power. Furthermore, advancement of, of House Dagoth, as in all great houses, is by challenge and confrontation of the hierarchy. The Nereverine's challenges and defeats of the Ash Vampires in battles with the Sixth House will be viewed in that light. Dagothur and the Kin may assume the Nereverine's ambition is to control the Heart. Given that assumption, it's only reasonable Nere the Nereverine would try to defeat each of Dagothur's subordinates in turn, working up to Dagothur. If he can defeat Dagothur and control the Heart, so much the better, but logically the Nereverine would wish rise high in the hierarchy as possible before cutting a deal with the head of the house. Dagothur should try to recruit the Nereverine into House Dagoth. It may be possible to pretend to join him and then betray him. Any attempt to deceive him will be very risky. House Dagoth has had a tradition of subterfuge and treachery, and because he himself is a deceiver, he will expect deception. We have no compulsion upon the Nereverine to adhere to the plans described here. We believe they offer the best chance of destroying Dagothur, but we have also chosen to place our trust in the Nereverine's judgment and skill. Frankly, we see no alternative. If there are doubts or questions, speak with Vivek. He has agreed to serve as the Nereverine's guide and counselor for the campaign. This is something that Vivek allegedly historically did. He was uh, Nerevar's counselor and guide for the time when Nerevar was Hortator of the Great Houses and friends with all the Ashlanders. Um, but in the 36 Lessons of Vivek, uh, Vivek practically raises the man. And at one point, Nerevar even says that he is the strongest of Vivek's sons. It may be that if the Nereverine succeeds, the Tribunal will not survive. Such sentiments as might have been expressed to the Tribunal should, in that case, be addressed to the land and people of Morland. May our happy convergence of fortune and prayer meet in destiny. On behalf of Lady Omalexia and Lord Sothasil, Vivek. How long is this? Oh, that's also long. What about you? Yep. Oof. Alright. Let's talk to the man. I stand here on your little triangle and greet you as an equal. I expected you. We have business, you and I. When I was young like you, I was very impatient, so I will keep our business short. Then later, there may be more time for other things. First, I propose to remove my curse upon the Nereverine and the persecution of the Dizzin of Priests, and proclaim to all of Morwen that Glena Pitchland is the incarnate and Nereverine, prophesied savior of Morwen, and the last hope to withstand the menace of Dagoth or in the Sixth House. These things I will do whether you wish or not. Next, I will propose to surrender to you the power and responsibility of defeating Dagoth Ur. You may choose to refuse. I will not compel you. You will receive this power as a gift in the form of an artifact called Wraithguard. You may accept the gift and do with it as you will. You will receive the responsibility as an oath. You may give your oath and then keep it or break it as you like. First, will you accept Wraithguard as a gift? So, Vivek is practically on his hands and knees here, just like, for the love of me, please help us. It depends. I'll take your maybe as a no. That concludes our interview. I hope it's not been an inconvenience. If you change your mind, come back. I accept Wraithguard. Sensible of you. You will give your oath before all gods and men, before all spirits, visible and invisible, before my honor and your honor, to dedicate yourself and Wraithguard to the defeat and destruction of Dagothur and the preservation of Morwen and its people? I so swear. Not very sensible, but very good. I was hoping for somebody who would have no hesitation on making such an oath. You will now have a brief momentary session of time passing. Don't be alarmed, you are being taken out of time in order to avoid the unpleasant sensation of learning how to use Wraithguard. It will be over before... There's a brief sensation of motion in total darkness, floating but without a sense of weight or direction. You know it. Before you know it. Now I will notify the temple that you are our champion. There will be no more persecution of the distant priests, and I hope both sides shall swiftly be reconciled. 
We have time for questions if you like. Or you may leave as you wish. But there are at least two things you should know before you leave. How to use Wraithguard and how to defeat Dagothor. Go to Red Mountain to recover the Hammer Sunder from Gate Citadel Vemnal and recover the Artifact Blade Keening from Gate Citadel Ordosal. Proceed with Wraith Guard, Sunder, and Keening to the Citadel Dagoth Ur. Within it, find the Heart of Lorcan, use the three artifacts to sever the connection to the Heart, and he will be destroyed and the Blight ended on Morrowind. You must sever his connection with the Heart of Lorcan. Strike the Heart with the Hammer Sunding once, and then strike the Heart more than once with the Artifact Keening. Wear Wraith Guard because you cannot handle either Sunder or Keening unless you are wearing Wraith Guard. That's the short, simple explanation. Here is the long, uh, detailed explanation written down for your convenience. Read it, study it, commit it to memory. So we, in fact, of course, just read the plan to defeat Nick. In my library, I've made available two conflicting accounts of the events of Red Mountain my own true account and another false account common among the Ashlanders and preserved in the Apocrypha. I don't care whether you believe my account or not. It is up to you which is true. I want your trust and willing cooperation, so I've had the priest make copies of a number of documents. They're up here for you to read or take with you. Take a look at them. Help yourself. So yes, Vivek claims that he has the true um, answer of what happened in Red Mountain. Uh, as I've mentioned, I think he's full of shit. And why would the Ashlanders keep it a secret or, like, have to run around in secret if they didn't have the truth? Oh god, my cat's on my desk. I see no god up here. Other than me. I will love that. What is it, boy? Look at this. I'm floating higher than you. Does that make you feel inadequate? It should. Uh, vengeance, don't do that, please. I know you're very cute and I love you very much. But you're being something of a pain. Oh, he do a big yawn. He's just rubbing his face on my computer. Look at him. I really don't trust it when you do that, dude. jar here he is you know I feel sorry for the people who are expecting a really really exciting episode because I was like, next time we're going to speak to Vivek. But, like, a lot of the things ha that happen in Morrowind happen without a lot of um, gravitas. Like, you have Corpus, and then, like, you do, like, two days worth of walking and quest. And then it's like, all right, you're immune to Corpus and every disease, and you're immortal, and you'll never die. Get out of here, you little scamp. But yeah, that's kind of the thing about Morrowind sometimes. But then also I feel sorry for the people who are like, yeah, it's going to be really exciting. And then it's just like me reading shit and goofing around with my cat. All right. Transcript of the words of Lord Vivek addressed to a distant priest, Malar Omine, who confronted Vivek with the Ashlander tradition surrounding the Battle of Red Mountain and prophecies of the Nerevarine who unnamed and to unnamed magistrates of the Inquisition, who joined Vivek in interrogating the distant priest. Who can clearly recall the events of the distant past, but you have asked me to tell you in my own words the events surrounding the Battle of Red Mountain, the birth of the Tribunal, and the prophecy of a reborn Nerevar. Here's what I can tell you. 
When the Chimer first abandoned the herds and tents of our nomadic ancestors and built the first great houses, we loved the Daedra and worshipped them as gods. Our brethren, the Dwemer, scorned the Daedra and mocked our foolish rituals and instead preferred their gods of reason and logic. Those aren't gods. Those are just the concepts of reason and logic. Dwemer be like that. Um... So they were uh, always at bitter war until the Nords came and invaded Resdane. Resdane is the old name for Morrowind, along with uh, Veloth. Only then did we put aside, put away their strife, and join together to cast out the invaders. When they were driven out, General Nerevar of the Chimer and General Dumak of the Dwemer, who had come to love and respect one another, resolved to make peace between their peoples. In that time, it was but a junior counselor to Nerevar and Nerevar's queen, Omalexia. And to his other favorite counselor, Sothasil, uh, had doubted that such a peace might long survive, given the bitter disputes between Dwemer and Chimer. But by negotiation and compromise, Nerevar and Dumak managed to preserve a fragile peace. But when Dagoth Ur, house of Lord, da Lord of House Dagoth, and trusted by a friend by the Nerevar and the Dwemer, brought as proof the high engineer Kaganrak of the Dwemer had discovered the heart of Lorcan, and learned how to tap its powers, and was building a new god a mockery of Chimer faith and a fearsome weapon, we urged Nerevar to make war on the dwarves to destroy the threat of the Chimer delete to the threat to Chimer beliefs and security. Nerevar was troubled. He went to Dumak and asked if what Dagoth Ur said was true. But Kaganrak took great offense and asked whom Nerevar thought he was that he might presume to judge the affairs of the Dwemer. Nerevar was further troubled and made pilgrimage to Holmayan, the sacred temple of Azura, and Azura confirmed that Dagoth Ur was indeed true and the creation of a new god of the Dwemer should be prevented at all costs. When Nerevar came back and told us of what the goddess had said, we felt our judgments confirmed and counseled him to war, chiding Nerevar for his naive trust and friendship, and reminding him of his duty to protect the faith and security of the Chimer against the impiety and dangerous ambitions of the Dwemer. Nerevar went back to Vardenfell one last time, hoping that negotiation and compromise might again once again preserve the peace. But Nerevar and Dumak quarreled bitterly, and as a result, the Chimer and Dwemer went to war. The Dwemer were well defended by their fortress at Red Mountain, but Nerevar's cunning drew most of the armies into a field and pinned them there. And then Nerevar, Dagoth, and a small group of companions could make it to the Heart Chamber by secret means. Nerevar and the Chimer King... Nerevar the Chimer King met Dumak the Dwarf King, and they both collapsed from grievous wounds and draining magics. With Dumak fallen, threatened by Dagoth, Er, and others, Kagenrak turned his tools upon the Heart, and Nerevar said he saw Kaganrak and all of his Dwemer companions at once disappear from the world. In that instant, Dwemer everywhere disappeared without a trace. But Kaganrak's tools remain, and Dagoth Ur sees them, and he carried them to Nerevar, saying, That fool Kaganrak has destroyed his own people with these things. We should destroy them right away, lest they fall into the wrong hands. And he was right. But. Nerevar was resolved to confer with his queen and generals, who had foreseen that this war would come and counsel he would not ignore a second time. I asked the tribunal what we will do with them, what we will do with them, for they have had wisdom in the past that I have not. Stay here, loyal Dagothur, until I return. So Nerevar told Dagothur to protect the tools in the heart chamber until he returned. Then Nerevar was carried to us where we waited on the slopes of Red Mountain, and he told us what had transpired under Red Mountain. Nerevar said that the Dwemer had used the tools to turn their people into immortals, and the Heart of Lorcan held wondrous powers. Only later did we hear from others present that Dagoth Ur had thought the Dwemer destroyed, not made immortal, and no one knows for sure what really happened there. After hearing him, we gave our counsel as he requested, proposing we should preserve these tr tools in trust for the welfare of the Chimer people. And who knows, perhaps the D Dwemer are not gone forever, but transported to some distant realm, from which they may, from, they may someday return to threaten their security again. Therefore, we need to keep the tools to study them and their principles so that we, we may be safe in future generations. And though Nerevar voiced his grave misgivings, he was, will, he was willing to be ruled by our council under one condition. We should swear a solemn oath under Azura that tools would never be used in the profane manner that Dwemer had intended. We agreed and swore solemn oaths at Nerevar's dictation. So we went with Nerevar back into Red Mountain and met with Tegoth. Dagoth Ur refused to deliver the tools to us, saying that they were dangerous and we could not touch them. He, they, he was correct. He seemed to be irrational, insisting only he could be trusted with the tools, and that we. And then we guessed he had somehow been affected by his handling of the tools. But now I feel sure he had privately learned of the powers of the tools, and had in some confused way decided he must have them for himself. 
Nerevar and our guard resorted to force to secure the jewels. Somehow, Dagathar and the retainers escaped, but we gained the tools and delivered them to Zothasil for study and safekeeping. For some years, we kept the oaths we sold to Azura, swore to Azura with Nerevar. But during that time in secret, Sothasul must have studied the tools and divined their mysteries. At last, he came to us with the vision of a new world of peace with justice and honor for nobles. There's no honor in Morrowind. Just like literally... Hey, is this guy causing you some trouble? Bureaucratically speaking, kill him. Honor. What a load of shit. Uh, health and prosperity for the commoners. Uh-huh. And the tribunal as immortal patrons and guides. Dedicating ourselves to this vision of a better world, we made a pilgrimage to Red Mountain and transformed ourselves with the power of King Rack's tools. No sooner had we completed our rituals and begun to discover our newfound powers, the Daedra Lord Azura appeared and cursed us for our forsworn oaths. By her powers of prophecy, she had assured us that her champion, Nerevar, true to his oath, would return to punish us for our perfidy, and to make sure such profane knowledge would never again be used to mock and defy the will of the gods. So the, so the Sil said to her, The old gods are true and arbitrary, and distant from the hopes and fears of Myr. Your age is past, where the new gods born of the flesh, and wise and caring of the needs of our people. Spare us your threats and chiding, in constant spirit. We are bold and fresh, and will not fear you. So it was Sotha Sil's fault. In that moment, all Kymer were changed into Dunmer. Our skin turned ash and our eyes into fire. Of course, we only knew at the time this had uh, happened to us, but Azura said, this is not my act, but your act. You have chosen your fate and the fate of your people, and all of the Dunmer shall share your fate from now to the end of time. You think yourself gods, but you are blind, and all is darkness. Azura left us in darkness... And we were afraid, but we put on brave faces and went forth from Red Mountain to build the new world of our dreams. And the new world we shaped was glorious and generous, and the worship of the Dunmer fervent and grateful. The Dunmer were at first afraid of their new faces, but Sotha still spoke to them, saying it was not a curse but a blessing, a sign of their changed natures and a sign of the special favor that we might enjoy as new myrrh. No longer barbarians trembling before ghosts and spirits, but civilized myrrh, speaking directly to their immortal friends and patrons, the three faces of the tribunal. We were inspired by Sothasil's speech and vision. We took heart. Over time, we crafted the customs and institutions of a just and honorable society. The land of Resdane, new millennia of peace, equity, and prosperity unknown to other savage races. Beneath Dagoth Ur... Beneath... Well, the Red Mountain is actually called Dagoth Ur. But because Vorin Dagoth has taken that as his name, uh, they call it Red Mountain to avoid confusion. But underneath Red Mountain, Dagoth Erd survived, and even as the bright of our bold new world shined even more brightly, beneath Red Mountain the darkness gathered, a darkness that was close kin to the bright light Sotha still had coaxed from the heart of Lorcan with the tools of Kaganrak. As the darkness grew, we fought it and crafted walls to confine it, but we could never destroy it, for the source of the darkness was the same source as our own divine inspiration. And in the later days of Morrowind, reduced to a subjugated province of the Western Empire, as the glory of the temple fades and the dark tide rises from a mountain, we were reminded of Azura and her promised champion's return. We have waited blind and in darkness, mere shadows drained of our ardent vision, in shame of our folly and in fear of our judgment, and in hope of our deliverance. We do not know if the outlander claiming... Oh, lost it. Do not know if the... Uh, there it is. To fulfill the prophecy of the Nerebrian is our old companion Nerevar reborn, or a pawn of the emperor, or a cat's paw of Azura, or a simple twist of fate. But we insist you adhere to temple doctrine and conform to the strictures dividing the hierographa from the apographa and that do, you do not speak that which should not be spoken openly. Act as a dutiful priest should in accordance with the vows of obedience to the canon and arch canons. All will be forgiven. Defy me and you will know what it is to stand against a god. Well, it's a difficult fight, but something's still over in a few minutes. following documents were prepared, yada yada. From interrogation of captured sleepers and other six house cultists, from study and manuscripts written by cultists and victims of dream-induced mania, interviews with Lord Vivek concerning historical campaigns against Lord Red Mountain, and broad conjectures and inferences made upon these materials, is our best estimate of Dagoth Ur's motivation and objectives in this most recent phase of the war against Morrowind. So this is Dagoth Ur's plan. Establish a theocracy based on the worship of newborn god Akulakan, second Numidium, to be created by Dagoth Earth from the heart of Lorcan and a body constructed according to the principles and rituals pioneered by the Dwemer Kaganrak. 
the Dwemer built a giant mech that was going to become a god. We know about this, and it was what the plot of the second game, The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, was about. Daggerthor is trying to build a second one. Numidium was never united with its power source. The true Numidium was never brought to the heart of Lorcan, but they were supposed to be used together. Vivek gave Numidium to um, the Emperor in exchange for uh, in exchange for Morwind being not a true part of the Empire. Um, and the Emperor had to figure out his own way to power the damn thing. And the true power source has been stuck underneath Red Mountain. Um, and they're trying to make a new body for it. And they're trying to actually make it a real god. Something piloted by Dagoth Ur, though. Establish the ancient heirs of House Dagoth as the god priest of Akulakan, and the sixth house of Dagoth Ur as the dominant political power in Morrowind. Under charismatic conversion, unite the Dunmer against the, under the guidance of Dagoth Ur to battle against the foreign animals who mold, hold Morrowind in subjection. Um, Dagoth Ur has apparently adopted the views and motivations of the Dwemer High Craftlord Kaganrak. In effect, he recapitulates the ancient blasphemous folly of the Dwemer. So, this is the thing that no one talks about, but Dagoth Ur has become like Kaganrak. No one really talks or says anything about that. But considering that Dagoth Ur was born Vorn Dagoth and is very different after the fact. Who knows? Maybe the Dwemer are all gone, but Kaganrak is elsewhere. Not the same place that the Dwemer are. Who knows? Expose the false worship of the tribunal and destroy the ecclesiastic order of and political power of the temple. How much the distant priests or the cult of the Neverine may be controlled or influenced by the Sixth House in this regard is open to speculation. Yeah, the Nereverine and the Sixth House might get along if not for the problems. Exterp extirpate all remaining individuals of inferior and mongrel races from Morrowind. Jesus. You want to sell your role, Dagoth? Or, this is one of the problems with Dagoth. Or, even if I, I agree with what he says to a point, but he is violently racist and jingoistic and patriotic. And like, in the hypothetical cut quest line where you team up with Dagoth, or, I want that to be a thing, but I want Nereverine's quest with Dagoth Ur to be a lot more gentle than his quest without it. Um, recover ancient... Drive the Empire from Morrowind. Recover ancient territory stolen by Skyrim and Argonia. Skyrim was initially the home of um, the Snow Elves. The... They work... The Otmorans is their proper name. The Otmorans took it over and became the Nords as they lived there. Um, and there are a few provinces or places in Skyrim that are Dunmer. Uh, this is part of why Windhelm has such a high Dunmer population when you go there in Skyrim. And lest we forget, this island, Solstheim, is jointly owned by Skyrim and Morrowind. They also want to kick people out of Argonia, which is where the Argonians live. I think it is properly called the Black Marsh. Uh, extend the worship of Akulakan to all nations of Tamriel through subversion and conquest. Plans to establish and expand the Sixth House. Secure Red Mountain against tribunal intruders. Deny tribunal access to the heart, weakening the temple while securing Red Mountain for the creation of Akulakan. Keep construction of Second Numidium a secret. Create passive servants in ever-widening circles around Red Mountain, Red Mountain by broadcasting compulsions couched in dream imagery to susceptible subjects in their sleep. Establish a major operational base at Kogarun. Recall that we went there uh, for further operations in the Ash Wastes. Establish smaller bases near small port villages and in lower class, class waterfront districts in Vivek. Infiltrate and subvert smuggling syndicates. Recruit willowing, willing followers from disaffected populations including the underworld, the poor, and rabid anti-imperial activists. So, Dagoth Ur is not weak. He's very strong, but he's also not dumb. Alduin in Skyrim is just kind of like, blarg, just rolling over the world like a fat man, destroying a bunch of things as he goes. 
just trying to just fuck things up. And who's the Marin's Dagon is does not have a very complex plan to take over Cyrodiil and then the rest of the world. Neither does Molag Ball in Elder Scrolls Online. But um, he does have a plan as opposed to Alduin, which is just wanton random destruction. Um, but Dagoth Ur has a very, very calculated, well-balanced plan here. <laughs> Uh, expand from smaller bases to other towns and villages and recruit and indoctrinate subjects made susceptible by dream sendings. Occupy abandoned towers and ruins and train corrupted cultists as raiders and irregular troops. Identify, discredit, and decimate possible sources of political resistance. Use assassination and terror to weaken, distract, and disrupt the legions and imperial bureaucracy, along with Halalu sympathizers. Inspire popular uprisings of the native poor against the foreign rich and powerful. Summon sleepers and dreamers to Dagoth Ur to work on the second Dominion. This is so the game uh, Odd World was initially just like well known as Odd World Abe's Odyssey, and then it had like kind of a messy jump to 3D. Um, and the game was just supposed to be a 3D Abe's Odyssey. Uh, Abe's Odyssey has a sequel, Abe's Exodus, that has the exact same gameplay styles, and then it has a weird spin off where you run around hunting things. Um, but one thing about uh, Odd World is that it's supposed to be a constructed world with five different mainline games. Of those five, we've only gotten two. We've gotten the first game where you play as an escape slave and lead people to safety and victory. And the second game kind of follows the same thing, but in 3D. But what is supposed to actually be happening there is that there are supposed to be five games, all of which are completely different genres, which is so unique. I talked earlier about how the Elder Scrolls are single-player RPGs in the purest goddamn sense of the word. But it would be so, so interesting, again, if, like Oddworld, they attempted to diversify and broaden, and you could get a view of the world from the point of view of somebody who is in charge of an army. Um, and some of the intent is here, and it's part of why I'm writing that fan fiction. Uh, Dagoth Ur thinks on a large time scale, for the most part in the outside of time scale of the divine consciousness. So yes, Dagoth Ur is not really inside of time here. Um, he thinks the only obstacles of mythic scale are worth consideration. He believes he's fated to rule Morrowind, to free Morrowind of the Empire, to become the new hard-living father of Morrowind. Given that perspective, the only opposing forces Dagoth Ur worries about are the Tribunal, Daedra, Emperor, and Incarnate. With the Tribunal's loss of Sunder and Keening, the diminishing powers of the Tribunal, Dagoth Ur, he's permanently gained a decisive strategic advantage. On a mortal time scale, the battle may last for centuries, but the outcome is not in doubt, and a Kulakan may be a device for dramatically reducing the time scale for a decisive victory. The myth of dynamic invincibility of the Emperor and the Empire has long been an unquantifiable and intimidating threat. But recent rumors of unrest in Cyrodiil, the Emperor's failing health, and the unsettled question of the succession have diminished the scale of that threat. This whole paragraph, by the way, would essentially become the plot of Oblivion, as I'm led to believe. The Emperor gets assassinated, and figure out whose butt is going to sit in the chair is the plot of Oblivion. But also, there's a bunch of other problems going on which form the rest of the plot. That's one of the things about the Elder Scrolls, um... Philosophically speaking, Sothasilla has gotten very bored and disaffected with the real world. He doesn't care about it. And the rest of the tribunal is having that happen to them as well. Um, Vivek says that he can see the Nereverine as an equal. Greeted by someone as an equal. Um, they're both kings. They're both ruling kings. And a couple of other things imply that Vivek is aware he's in a video game. But in a different way of like, ooh, you know, scary, like, Doki Doki Literature Club shit. Vivek is powerful here and enjoys it. And, but he's also getting bored with his own power. Why would someone get bored of an Elder Scrolls game? Well, the answer is, people get bored of an Elder Scrolls game all the time. My dad played like a thousand hours of Skyrim, but he got bored. And stopped playing it because 
he had done everything that you can really do in that game. He did every quest line. Like, even things he didn't want to really do, like killing Parthenax and establishing the blades, he did because it was something to do. And he got bored with it, and he has never gone back. And it has been almost 10 years since my father has played Skyrim. The Dovahkiin is a hero, much like the other player characters are. And in that, Vivek can greet the Dovahkiin as a mutual as well. What does that exactly mean? All of them are immortal, unkillable, and of supreme power. Because if you kill a hero, they just load the save. And they're also very difficult to kill. At some point, the game runs out of difficult enemies to throw at you. Funny, huh? So, yes. Um... So, let's think about that for a little further. You get bored when you run out of things to do. Vivek has run out, run out of things to do. He's bored. He is disinterested with Morrowind. But he lives here. We, the player characters, are the true dreamers. And we can leave when we want to. And go do something else. We can reset the world and start a new character and do all of the things at the start from the beginning again. We can play a different game and go to a different era of time. We're still the same dreamer with different bodies. Um, and that's kind of the thing. We can be greeted by Vivek as an equal, but we truly have more power than Vivek because Vivek is stuck here. Um, the Daedra have this problem as well. So too do the Divines. Um, this is probably, possibly why the Divines don't stick their nose in Nern in any, anymore. And why the Daedra only show up rarely. But consider when the Daedra actually show up. They show up when other things are happening. In the same way that the player only views parts of Tamriel when interesting things are occurring because that's when the games are set. The Daedra do as well. The Daedra recognize that there is a hero, that there is a true dreamer, a player character here. And they're like, oh, what else is going on? And what else is going on? Well, um, in Oblivion, the Emperor's been assassinated. The Dark Brotherhood's under fire. Uh, there's a whole thing going on with all of the plot lines in there. In Morrowind, there's a blight. The tribunal's power is fading. Dagoth Ur's running wild over here. Um, the Red Aron are trying to reestablish this citadel stronghold. Like, all of these other things are going on. In Skyrim, yes, Alduin has returned, and there's a big fucking dragon war going on. But there's also a civil war between all the people of Skyrim. And then there's the werewolf problem in the Companions. And the Mage's College is currently undergoing some stuff. And the Old Mary Dominion is trying to establish, like, apartheid, basically. Um, and so that's why the Daedra show up in every game. They're interested. They care. They give a shit. They think that it is cool that all these things are happening. And so they look. They observe. Because it's fun for them. And in the same way, the player character is there, too. But Vivek still lives inside of time, mostly. Um, he's stuck here, and so he's gotten really fucking bored. And, yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting thing that, like, I'm not even sure if it's intended by the text, but that's how I think of this. Anyway. The, re the revelation that the Reverend is a pawn of Imperial intelligence handpicked and sent to Morwen by the Emperor himself may cause Dagoth or considerable anxiety. The Daedra represent no co coherent obstacle to Dagoth or. None of them really act together. Daedra do not work together. That's kind of their thing. The Divines, the Aedra, do work together. The Daedra don't. Can't, even. It's not that they won't, it's that they can't. It's, it's anathema to them. Like, they do not do it. Nonetheless, their personal abilities and their influence on their fanatic followers is considerable. Their motives and actions are obscure, and Dagoth Ur remains concerned about them. 
The incarnate represents St. Nerevar, a mythic force that has previously defeated Dagoth Ur, and Dagoth Ur is obsessed with this threat. At the same time, Dagoth Ur knew Nerevar personally, knew that he was a mortal man with faults and weaknesses. He may have some hope of seducing or negotiating Nerevar's reincarnation. Further, when Nerevar and the Tribunal defeated Neg Dagoth Ur, they were strong and allied. Now Nerevar and the Tribunal are weak, opposed, and divided. Therefore, the Nerevar and the Tribunal represent the most serious threat to Dagoth Ur's plans. He still has good reason to believe that this time he will prevail. And then a timeline of the activities. It's based on inference from incomplete observation. Sometime before this, Dagoth Ur and his kin lie dreaming beneath the sills of Red Mountain. Dagoth Ur woke up. They emerge from Lower Red Mountain to the Heart Chamber. Dagoth Ur ritually binds himself and the Brethren as Heart Whites in a ritual of his own devising. First stage of construction of Second Numidium, conceived during the Long Sleep, are begun by Heart Whites and Octra constructs in a chamber near the heart of Lorcan. Keeping the Second Numidium project a secret from the Tribunal is a high priority. Later that same year, the Tribunal arrive at Red Mountain for their annual ritual bathing in the Heart's Power. So the reason that the Tribunal were so strong for so long is because every year they would go back and dip in. Um, 2E is when... Second Era, that is. Second Era is when... Uh, I want to say it's when Daggerfall takes place, but I'm not sure. I know for a fact that it is when um, Elder Scrolls Online takes place. Um, Morrowind and Oblivion are in Third Era. But in fact, Oblivion is the very end of the Third Era. And Skyrim is in the fourth, naturally. Dagoth Ur and the Ash Vampires ambush the Tribunal. The Tribunes are driven away and prevented from destroying themselves with restoring themselves with Kaganrak's tools at the heart of Lorcan. From that year to 3E417, Intermutant Tribunal campaigns to assault Red Mountain. The Tribunal and supporting forces seek to force access to the Heart Chamber, but are repeatedly driven back. Dagoth Ur recruits sleepers and dreamers through dream sendings. Cultists are recruited through dream compulsion. Weaker cultists com become corpus beasts. Stronger cultists advance through stages towards the powers of the ascended sleepers. Recall that we've met and fought ascended sleepers. So that's all the way to 417. In 400, Kogarun was reoccupied by Dagoth Uthol and fortified as an advanced base for six health operations. Blightstorms become much more frequent and widespread. Soul sickness spreads in regions close to Red Mountain. Ten years later, Six House Base is founded near Narmok and in waterfront areas of Vivek. Six House operatives exploit smuggler operations and communications to spread their influence among victims unbalanced by Dagoth Ur's dream sendings. Uh, five years later, small cells of Six House cultists in every town in Vardenfell. Larger Six House operations are concealed in remote dungeons where creatures are bred and cultists are trained for the upcoming struggle. Um, Seventeen. Almalexi and Sothasil use the artifacts Keening and Sunder to Dagoth, Ordos, and Vemin. Vivek rescues Almalexi and Sothasil, but failing to re recover Keening and Sunder, the Tribunal retreat from Red Mountain in disorder. Surviving buoyant armager companions know the Tribunal is forced to retreat, but do not know how serious a reversal the Tribunal has suffered. The three Triunes return to their respective capitals and continue to perform their ritual functions. The Triunes continue to grow weaker without access to the heart and because of resources required to support the ghost fence. The inner circle of the Tribunal Priesthood has begun to suspect the Tribunes have suffered seriously from wounds and demoralization at the wake of reverses at Red Mountain, but do not recognize the scale of the problem. Um, another ten years later. Campaign of Six House Assassinations and Prominent Ass Imperial Citizens and Halalu Imperial Citizen. Sympathizers. Um, Six House has been assassinated a whole bunch of important dudes with the Empire. Sudden increase in number and seriousness of attacks by cultists and victims deranged by soul sickness. Noted with concern, Dagoth Ur can apparently perceive and communicate directly through his cultists. Sleepers and dreamers are often reported speaking as though with Dagoth Ur's voice and intention. Little is known about the features, scale, or stage of completion of Kulakan, the second Numidium. No one has gained entrance to the Heart Chamber since 2E-282. In 3E-417, Keating and Sunder were captured and may substantially aid in Kulakan's destruction. construction. Wow. A lot of reading. And then this is from the Apographa. 
It is a scholarly retelling of a tradition transmitted through the Ashlanders concerning the battle at Red Mountain and subsequent events. The Ashlanders associated this tale with the telling of An Alandro Sul, a shield companion of Nerevar who came to live among the Ashlanders after the death of Nerevar and the ascension of the Tribunal. Remember that our go-to Ashkan is named Sul Matul. Um, I don't know if he's descended from him, but it would make sense. Um, there are many variation, variant treatments of this story, but the primary elements are consistent throughout the tradition. The murder of Nerevar, the tragic fate of Dagoth Ur, and the profane source of the tribunal's divine power are denied by temple doctrine as ignorant Ashlander superstition and not widely known among civilized Dunmer. Resdane, present-day Morrowind, was contested ground between two very different types of Mur, Chimer, who worshipped Daedra, and Dwemer, who worshipped profane, profane and secret power. So recall that in this one, they do not even mention that the Dwemer worshipped something profane, just that they used reason and logic to own the liberals. Um... Their lands were invaded by... They warred constantly until their lands were invaded by a young, vibrant, and violent alien culture, the Nords. Two heroes, one from the Chimer and one from the Dwemer, Indril Nerevar and Dumak Dwarf Orc, made peace between their people and together ousted the alien invaders. These two heroes worked long and hard to maintain that peace thereafter, though their counselors thought they could not last, or worse, that it shouldn't. Nerevar's queen and his generals... Uh, Amalexius, Sothasil, and Vivek told him to claim all of Resdane for his own. Nervar would not listen, for he remembered his friendship with Dumak. There would be only peace. Until Dagoth Ur arrived, House Dagoth had discovered the source of profane and secret power of the Dwemer, the legendary heart of Lorcan, which Dumak's people had used to make themselves immortal and beyond the measure of gods. In fact, one of their new high priests, Kaganrak, was building a new god so the Dwemer could claim Resdane for their own. I realized, by the way, that for a couple of years, I've been saying Red Sane. Uh, red does make a lot of sense because it's the Red Mountain. But uh, that's probably my Dilsexia coming into play. Tribunal urged Nervar to make war on the dwarves. Nervar was troubled, went to Dumak, asked if it was true. Kaganrak talked shit. Uh, this part is pretty much the same. Nerevar angered his friend Dumak would lie to him when back to Vardenfell. The Chimer King was arrayed in arms and armor and had his host around him, and he spoke harshly to Dumak Dwarf King, Dwarf Orc, King of Red Mountain. You must give up your worship of the, of the Heart of Lorcan, or I shall forget our friendship and the deeds that were accomplished in its name. Dumak, who still knew nothing of Kaganrak's new god, was proud and protective as ever of his people, and said, We will not relinquish that which has been our way for years beyond reckoning. Just as the Chimer will not relinquish their ties to the lords and ladies of Oblivion. Come to my door in this way, arrayed in arms and armor with your hosts around you. Tells me you've already forgotten our friendship. Stand down, my sweet Nerevar, or I will swear by the fifteen and one golden tones, I shall kill you and your people. Tones here being the sounds that they use to manipulate the world. And fifteen and one is interesting. There are eight divines, and typically there are considered to be sixteen Daedra. Um, of course, the ninth divine does not exist yet. Lorcan is dead, and um, the thing to create him has not even been given to the guy that will become him yet. So, eight divines and sixteen Daedra. But also, fifteen and one, well, my math tells me that's 16, the same number as there are Daedra. Why 15 and 1? Some people write it as a weird way of saying, you know, just a number, like 4 and 20 is 24. Um, but consider this. Earlier, much earlier, like 10 episodes ago, we discussed Trinimac and Malakath, the Daedra Lord of the Orcs. Initially, he was Trinimac, a divine and became a Daedra. He was an Aedra and became a Daedra because Boethia eat and ate and digested him. So, you could argue that the 16 Daedra are 15 and 1 because Malakath was not born a Daedra. We can't count the tribunal as divines. They weren't born gods and don't have the same kind of power, but 
many people consider Talos a divine. So what's the deal here? So perhaps the tones are based off of the Daedra. Who's to say? Uh, they went to war. They were well defended at the fortress of Red Mountain, but the bravery and cleverness of Nervar's queen and generals drew most of Dumak's armies under the field and kept them there. Uh, this part is the same. Um, Kaganrak took the tools and used them to tap into the heart. He went to the dying Lord Nervar and asked Dagoth or... Sorry. I've read a lot this episode. Dagoth or slew Kaganrag and took the tools used to tap the power of the heart. He went to the dying Lord Nervar and asked him what to do with him. Nervar summoned Azura and she showed them how to use the tools to separate the power of the heart from the Dwemer people. So in this version of it, Dagoth or kills Kaganrag, takes the tools, and Nervar asks Azura how they work. And then presumably Dagoth or is the one to kill all Dwemer. On the fields, the tribunal and their armies watched as the Dwemer turned to dust all around them as their stolen immortality was taken away. Nervar told Dagoth Ur to protect the tools. Dagoth Ur said, shouldn't we destroy these so they might never be used for evil again? But Nervar was confused for his wounds and sorrow, for he still loved Dumak and the Dwemer people, and went to the fields outside of Red Mountain to confer with queens and generals, who had foreseen this war would again, that war would again come, and whose counsel he would not ignore again. I will ask the tribunal what we should do with them, for they have had wisdom in the past that I have not. Stay here, Dag Dagoth, or until I return. So, in this, Nerevar is like, I don't know. Maybe we'll need them. And Dagoth is like, shouldn't we, shouldn't we fucking burn these, dude? Like, so again, this is another inconsistency set between them. And one could even see, because Nerevar is um, deified as a saint here, uh, he is saint sanctified even, um, one could see that they wouldn't want him to waver on this. Assuming Nerevar is like a Jesus, we want to see Dagothur as like a Satan. You know, we want them to be opposed, but here they're very conversational. Uh, Nerevar told the Queen's Generals that what had transpired. So yes, the Dwemer had made themselves all immortal with uh, the heart of Lorcan. So like the Tribunal did, like Lorcan or like um, Dagoth Ur is doing, and like the Tribunal did, they bound themselves to it and made themselves super powerful. But without it, they were undefined and couldn't go on. Uh, Tribunal decided that Keimer should learn to use this power so that Nervar might claim Resdain of the world for their people. Nervar did not expect or want this, and he asked his queens and earls to summon Azura again for her guidance. The tribunal had become as greedy as Kaganrak upon hearing the power of the heart, and they coveted it. They made ritual as if to summon Azura as Nervar wanted, but Amalexia used poison candles, so the Sil used poison robes, and Vivek used poisoned invocations. So they put poison on everything that would then be used, and so Nervar possibly may have been killed by, you know, all the venom things here. There is a piece of art of Vivek stabbing Nerevar through the chest from behind that is the art that I take as canon um, but I wish to refer to poisoned invocations it is unclear what that means it could mean that Nerevar was handed a piece of paper that he was supposed to read from to summon Azura and the paper itself was poisoned but considering how much Vivek has used words and how much the Dwemer themselves used sounds to get things done, it also could be possible that um, the words themselves were literally poisonous and killed Nerevar. But yes, this is explicit. Nerevar got murdered. Azura came forth anyway. It's unclear if like Azura saw that someone was fucking with her ritual or if the ritual actually was done correctly, just that it killed the guy who did it. Or if Azura was just watching Nerevar and didn't realize what was happening. Curse the tribunal. Uh, she, was, she told him she would use her powers over dawn and dust to make sure Nerevar would come back and make things right. Tribunal laughed at her. So initially it mentions that just so the Sil, the smart one, did it. But here, all three of them laugh. The tribunal. 
Uh, they would be gods themselves. The Chimera people would forget their old ways and worship. Azura knew this would be true and that it might take a long time before her power might bring Nerevar back. What you've done here today is foul beyond measure and you will grow to regret it for the lies of the gods are not what mortals think and matters that weigh on the years to mortals weigh on gods forever. They might know their wicked deeds. Azura changed the Chimera to Dunmer. Skin turned ash and eyes into fire. Let this mark remind you of your true selves who, like ghouls, fed on the nobility, heroism, and trust of their king. The tribunal went into Red Mountain and met with Dagoth Ur. Dagoth Ur saw it had been done for his skin and been changed as well, and he tried to avenge the death of Nerevar, but to no avail. He was driven off and thought dead. The tribunal found the tools he had been guarding, and through study of the methods, turned themselves into gods. Again, Dagoth Ur had already gone nuts in that story, and then Sothasil thought about it very casually, like, what if I were to do this? And then he went to them like, guys, check this out. What if we became gods? Here, the tribunal acts as a unit. Dagoth Orr is understandably incensed that they assassinated his best friend and their king and attempts to hold his oath. Thousands of years after their apotheosis, the tribunal are still the gods of Morrowind and the old ways of worship are remembered only by a few. And the murder of Nerevar is known to fewer, but his queens and generals still fear his return for the words of Azura linger long and they see the mark of her curse on their people every day. So, that was an hour of talking and reading, but you know what? I have been waiting for that this whole goddamn game because I love this part of the game. I love meeting... I love meeting him as an equal. I love that, like, he's just a guy sitting in here. Something mentioned in the 36 Lessons of Vivek is that Vivek himself is supposed to have fire hair. The reason that he's bald is because he shaved his head so that he could have flames instead. And he has now grown so weak he cannot maintain those. So. Red Mountain. Hammer. Blade. Combine them all together. Fight Dagothar. Go time is coming up. And the end of the game is rapidly approaching. So with that, I will see you guys next time. I've been Alfred. And yes, this episode was just talking and stuff, but next time, it's for real. So yeah, I'll see you guys then. Have a good day. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for sitting through this very long episode that no action happens in besides my non-canon fight with Vivek. But yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Um, end of the game's coming up. So get hyped.